Thank you for the invite. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. Um, so today I will be talking about a topic called the Internet of Federated Things. This talk is partially based on a paper that okay, I think that would be is partially based on a paper that we have recently wrote across multiple universities and people with a very different variety of expertise on what we envision the future of Internet of Things will be. Um, so for the introduction, I'll talk about what is the Internet of Things, what is the Internet of Federated Things, and I'll discuss some of our efforts along this line. Um, one, I will talk specifically about two approaches. One approach is more on the heuristic side, um, machine learning type of work, and the other approach is more on the fundamental theory of how can we do feature extraction in a distributed manner. Um, I just should mention that my talk is really intended to give you a snapshot of a field that is really still in its infancy. A lot of questions are still not answered, starting with a very fundamental question, how to do a distributed hypothesis test. So it's just a snapshot of a field in its infancy. So what is Internet of Things? Internet of Things is just a smart and connected system. At the beginning, we really had those physical system components that comprise the system. And then came IoT. We had a lot of sensor measurement capabilities. And we had this immense capability to collect data. And the hope of really Internet of Things is to exploit this data to do smart decisions, as in to move from a merely connected system to a smart and connected system. So what are some features of the smart and connected system? We have connectivity, where data is collected across multiple similar units. The hope is to become this connectivity becomes smart, where units get information from each other, share knowledge, borrow strength from each other in order to improve their predictive power. And this is indeed an old notion. Going back a long time ago, people used to come together to perfect and start to standardize their, their crafts. So the current Internet of Things systems, so I come from uh, Michigan and I work closely with GM and Ford, how do they do their analytics? They have cars on the road. If you subscribe for a specific service like uh, Ford Sinks or GM OnStar system, you have the, your information from the cars on the road uploaded regularly to a central server. And then the server, they do a lot of processing for your data and the hope is to keep the driver informed about the health of their vehicle. So what's happening here is a lot of data is being uploaded to a cloud. The cloud stores and learns these models, and then the models are deployed back. So what are some disadvantages of some of the systems? First of all, there is a lot of communication burden. The data that we are collecting, just uploading this data and downloading back the decisions costs a lot of money. There is also storage capacity. Actually, GM right now are spending so much money just storing all this data in the center of the soil. The other question is, are we really utilizing all the data? With all the data that's being pumped into this cloud, very, it's very hard to learn models given all the data. A neural network, just with a billion points, can expend energy equivalent to a four-hour trip on a flight, a four-hour round trip. So are we really utilizing all this data? And finally, the need to upload data is, is an issue. It causes privacy concerns. And indeed, many people in, are not subscribing to these services because they do not want Ford or GM to know about their personal data. But what is changing nowadays? What is changing is that the computational power of our devices is steadily increasing. I was just reading that just in Tesla, on the car itself, we have compute power equivalent to more than 500 MacBook Pros. AI chips are steadily infiltrating the market. It's very rare now, right now to buy a 3D printer without a Raspberry Pi. The Raspberry Pi used to cost thousands of dollars. Right now, the highest build is just $100. So this, we have this immense opportunity. We have this immense computational power right now at, the, at our edge devices. And this opens a new opportunity. And the opportunity is very simple. It allows us to process more of our data where it is created. And this is the key idea of federated data analytics. The hope is with this computational power at the edge, with the, with the AI chips infiltrating the market, is to process more of our data where it is created. And this is the very simple idea of the Internet of Federated Things, is to move from the cloud or a centralized place to the cloud. Okay, to move some of our data processing to the edge. Okay. 
So indeed, I can give this analogy that this is how our body functions. We get a lot of external stimuli, and this external stimuli is filtered because, before it goes to our central processing system, which is the brain. Indeed, many neurological disorders are based on the lack of ability to filter external stimuli before it reaches our central nervous system. So to give you a simple idea, and here I'm just taking one example of decentralization where we still have a central authority, and this central authority is somehow allowing different entities to borrow strength or collaboratively learn from each other. This is by no means the only way we can decentralize. It might be the situation where devices just talk to each other right away. There are many different settings, but just to give a very simple situation, if we have some computational power at the edge in such a setting, let's assume that the central server just wants to learn a mean over the features of all clients. If we have some computational power at the edge, instead of uploading our entire feature vector, we can just upload summary statistics or just the mean. If we are able to calculate the mean locally, then the mean is a sufficient statistic to learn the global mean. And this is the key idea. If we have some computational power here, we can process more of our data where it is created at the edge. And in, in general, the models we want to learn or what we want to achieve are more complicated. It cannot be done just in one shot. Just I send you the mean and you, you are able to solve the problem. It's often an iterative process where there is an, where there is iterations between a central orchestrator and the clients to improve, to refine, or learn better models. So why is this idea interesting? The first thing is privacy. Okay. If you are able to do some computations locally, you do not need, really need to share your entire data. You can just share whatever you learn or summary statistics from this data. And this causes also another thing, encryption. It's much, much easier to encrypt a summary statistic compared to encrypting entire data sets. The second thing is computation and energy. If you are, by just using the compute power at the edge, we are able to massively paralyze our modern learning efforts and reduce energy. So actually, interestingly, if you have an Android 13 phone, in the first week, you may find that your phone will be slower than expected. Why? Because Google is learning some of its models using the computational power at your devices. It's personalizing the models using your computational power, and it's saving them so much compute power because they're exploiting, exploiting the compute power of your devices. Cost. Of course, less information is transmitted. There is less exploitation of the network bandwidth and less storage needs, fast alerts and decisions. And this is usually very important. If I have a model locally, I do not need to wait for someone in a central server to send me back the decision or send me back the control action. I can achieve control at the edge right away. Fast inscription, resilience, you are a little bit resilient, resilient to failures at the central server. Diversity and fairness is also one, one issue that, for example, in medical settings, two hospitals could not collaborate together. Because of the HIPAA, they cannot share information together. But if you can achieve collaborative model learning without actually sharing this problem, this challenge can be overcome. So there is a lot of benefits. But here, before moving forward and talking more in detail, I should mention that indeed, this notion of distributed learning has been a notion for a while under the, in, in distributed settings. But distributed learning itself is very different than such a systems. Why? Distributed learning, what is it? It's a centralized system where our entities, our, our, our clients are compute nodes like GPUs. Distributed learning is based on this idea that I want to divide and conquer. But in our system, in a federated system, there is nothing to divide and nothing to conquer. You cannot divide the data because the data is at the edge. It's pre-partitioned. You cannot shuffle. You cannot randomize. You cannot somehow make the data IID. And the second of all, there is nothing to conquer. Usually, when you have multiple entities that you're learning a model over, you do not want to learn a global model. What you want to do is somehow borrow strength so that each model has a better, each client has a better model. So there is this fundamental difference between this notion of distributed learning in a centralized system and decentralized systems. Okay. And indeed, it comes with its own challenges. And those are some challenges because you do not want to share data. So I should mention here that 
This is a field that has gained a lot of attention in the past few years. Yet, it's very important to note that most of the applications that has, have been done are basically just how to learn a neural network using first order methods in a decentralized manner. But there are so many questions to be asked. And at some point, the applications themselves will dictate the challenges. Again, going back to the first thing that I mentioned today, we still do not know exactly how to do a hypothesis test in a distributed fashion. How to learn a graphical model, how to do uncertain quantification, how to do sequential design, how to do feature extraction. There are so many questions beyond just predictive analytics using how to do decision making under constrained systems. So it's a, it's a field in its infancy, and I hope through the stuff that I give you some, some big notion about some challenges and some interesting applications. So let me first dive a little bit into more the um, some technical stuff. This is more on the machine learning part. The, the paper that I will talk about is personalized federated learning via domain adaptation with application to distributed manufacturing. Okay. So this field of federated learning started from what we call global modeling, or we're trying to learn one model that fits all. So all the clients are collaborating to learn one big model. And just to establish the setting, assume we have n clients, and um, we're trying to learn some model, f of w parameterized by w. This model can be a neural network, a linear regression, anything, you name it. Usually our objective when learning this, this uh, big model is we want to minimize the empirical or the average risk over all clients. So somehow PI is some weight for each client, and we're trying to minimize an average over the empirical risk function over all clients. And the empirical risk function is usually just the summation over the data points of some loss function. If you're doing classification, maybe it's the cross entropy, regression type of stuff, this is perhaps the mean squared loss. Okay. So this is the general, usually the general objective in this global modeling where we're trying to learn one model W, one model parameter W that minimize the average empirical loss over a set of clients. Um, but the idea how to solve this setting, again, most of my talk today will be under the notion where I have a central orchestrator that is helping me do the learning. The idea is really two steps. I start with an initial model, let's say W. I send this W to my data, my clients. Each client does an update on W. Okay, this is called the client update. It, if it's a neural network, perhaps they do one step of stochastic gradient descent and then those updates go back and the central server acts as an aggregator it aggregates those updates and indeed the one of the very first models along this direction is a very simple model it's called federated averaging okay and interestingly what what each client does is just sgd they do one a few steps of gradient descent and then after doing a few steps of gradient descent the aggregator or the orchestrator just takes an average of the models. Okay. So this is the general notion right now of global modeling. You have you start with an initial model, you send it to the clients, the clients take an average and the clients do some updates locally to minimize their own empirical risk. And then this model is averaged back in the center of the okay. However, this obviously has some challenges when data is heterogeneous, simply because the global solutions, the, the solution of the global objective function is not the optimal solution of the local risk function. Okay, this is in general not true, where WI is some critical solution. It is only true if all the clients have the exact same, have IID distributions and our data set is infinite. Because, you know, the specificity of the SGD, uh, only, uh, we, can, we need infinite data to recover this exact equation. And indeed, Many, many work in this area have shown that one model that fits all will easily fail when you have heterogeneity. Okay. And interestingly, by the end of this lecture, I will show you an opposite conclusion. When we have heterogeneity, it's much better to learn models. Okay, so, so basically the reason is, more from an optimization perspective, is if clients, each client have different distributions or different data sets, when you do many updates, of your own model, somehow you bias your model to your own data, then taking an average will not work. It will cause perhaps the model to diverge or it will, will cause the model to have bad generalization accuracy. Okay. So the solution is personalization. Okay, 
what if instead of learning a global model, I learn a model, I learn, I learn different models for each different entity so that somehow client one gets a model, client two gets a model, and client three gets a model. So this, this has been explored in the past year or so, and then the notion of personalization. And the goal is really somehow minimize a weighted objective, where the goal is to find a set of parameters, set of global parameters, W, and the set of local parameters, theta i. So theta i are the personalized parameters, okay? So two approaches have been explored in this time, First approach is weight sharing, and this is very specific to neural networks. In weight sharing, what, we, what do we say? We say, okay, we have this neural network. Maybe the first set of layers, let's assume they are shared layers, and the last set of layers, let's assume they are personalized layers. So we all collaborate, doing perhaps the, the averaging to learn the first set of layers, and then at the end, and then each client alone, perhaps at the end, they learn their local models. Okay. So this is somehow we split the network, we learn a global a shared part, then we learn a personalized part. The other approach is what we call a trained and personalized approach. The idea is we learn a global model W star. We collaborate under the same network. We learn a global model W star. And then we say to each client, after I learn, I learn a good global model, okay, start from W star and then personalize. So somehow update W star, given your own data, but make sure to stay within some neighborhood of W star. So in some sense, what I want, I'm saying is W star include, encodes the global information. So update your model, but stay close to this globally encoded information. Okay. So this is somehow a trained and personalized approach. But let's take a simple counter example on both approaches. Let's assume your data is generated from sine functions with a phase shift. Okay. Let's assume u is normally distributed on zero, uh, is uniformly distributed on zero one. Those are very similar to vibration signals. In this situation, if you want to solve exactly such a model, or you want to do trend and personalize, you can directly prove that your population, not the empirical risk, your population risk has one unique minimizer, which is any w that predicts a zero. Uh, the, the algebra here is not that hard. It's very simple. Assuming that f, f is some functional over zero one, we can show that. That means if I have conflicting trends somehow in your data, your global model will learn nothing. And what's more is then you tell the model, okay, personalize given a very bad solution. So your personalization will also start from a very bad solution. Okay. So this is why this approach of personalization really needs to be refined. Why? Simply because heterogeneity in your data comes from two different types of heterogeneity. You have heterogeneity in your conditional distribution y given x, okay, which is what we are model. We're saying that each function is mapped by each y or output is mapped by a function with different parameters. So basically I'm looking at the different relationships of y and x across different clients, but heterogeneity is also defined as changes in the input value, okay. in probability of x. So the input space across different clients can be different. Some approach that just changes the parameter would only handle this conditional change across clients, but will not add us a change in the covariance. Okay. So this is usually called concept shift, and this is called covariate shift. And actually, this exact example, you can think about it as a covariate shift. Because your input space is somehow there is a phase shift in the input space across clients. So how do you solve a situation when there is indeed a covariate shift? And this is what this model does. Our idea is very simple. We say, okay, what if I can map my inputs x to some domain invariant space? This is the hope. I say, okay, let me model my outputs as a theta as a function of g of gamma i, which I will call a decoder, and theta of beta i, which I'll call an encoder. And the goal is what? To take my x, my input space across different clients, hopefully map this input space into a domain invariant space across all clients, and then I can decode, I can map back to the output space. 
So this is the goal of this model is somehow to create this encoder that brings different domains into a domain invariant space. Okay. But this model in itself cannot do anything. This model is a fully personalized model. There is no strength borrowing across different clients. This is beta i, this is gamma i. So well, what is the trick here? How do we solve this problem? We solve this problem using a bi-level optimization. Okay. Let me, before that, let me, instead of looking, this is a bi-level optimization problem where we have two different objectives, f i of tilde and f i. Okay. Let me go into different steps. Okay. So in the lower level of the bi-level optimization, we assume a shared encoder. So what does a shared encoder mean? We try to learn instead of G uh, decoder, instead of G gamma I, we learn G of W. This is a shared decoder. What does it mean? That means I want to learn a model such that all my inputs can be mapped using, from all the clients, can be mapped using a single parameter. And this itself, what does it say? It encourages this function to map all the inputs into a domain invariant space so that they all can be mapped by a single parameter. Okay. And then in the next step, we say, okay, now since I have domain invariant features, let me personalize the decoders and make sure you are close to W. And why we do not have the issue that I mentioned before? Because my first my first function itself, G is mapping. G is mapping inputs into a domain invariant space. Okay. So if you have a domain invariant space, you will not have the issue that I mentioned earlier on getting a bad global model when you personalize. So how we solve this model, basically we do some kind of a distributed gradient descent. I will not go into details, but turns out this model indeed has very, some very nice guarantees. The first, uh, the, the beta, the global, para, the encoders beta i, uh, converted at the rate of t over one over t, where t is the number of rounds that the global server communicates with the clients. However, for the decoder gamma i, we convert at a slightly lower rate, and this is a price to pay for personalization because we want to personalize inference. And let me just revisit one earlier example. So this is the sign functions. Okay. So you can see in this situation, this is our model, and and what does it do is indeed it we have each from each sign function we just have five data points okay if you do just each one learns individually you will really learn nothing if you do some approaches like a trend and personalize you will get a very bad initial model to start with however as you can see here using our domain shift uh, information we somehow can bring all the data into a domain invariant space and then map them back so actually, theoretically speaking, one interesting result here, yes. For that example, you need some actual assumption, right? The, the frequency needs to be the same. Do you know? If, mm -hmm. if you have a sinusoidal with different kinds of frequency. Okay. So, so this is happens? an example. Right. Yeah. So yeah, uh, they are the shifting, but yeah, this is an example. So assume your data, you assume your data is generated from alpha i sine two pi x plus theta i. And theta i is generated from uniform distribution, and alpha i is generated from a normal distribution, uh, mu theta. If you parameterize the model correctly, if your decoder function is somehow, uh, if your encoder function is just x plus something, and your decoder function is a sine function without knowing any parameters, let's assume we have the correct function parameterizations, you will find out that the global decoder. Theoretically speaking, when you minimize the population, there is, the global decoder will be mu a sine of 2 pi theta. And mu a is the true average. So your global decoder will be the center of all decoders. And then your encoder itself will be just the weighted average of the global decoder and the actual true parameter. This is much like a prior posterior interplay. So your global decoder is learning a good prior, a center point. And then, given the data from each client, somehow you're regularizing. Of course, this is my regularization parameter. This is my this is the information from my prior, and this is uh, the alpha i, which is the true parameter. So what's happening is I'm bringing all the data. This is assuming we have correct parameterizations. 
to the similar space, yes. Right. But your function actually confirm what I said, right? The, the two random parameter ones is after the magnitude. Another is the phase change. Your frequency stays the same. This one, yes. yes. So uh, because I'm not modeling, you can model it as a different parameter. Okay, right. I, I see what you're saying. Right. So, so here, you we're talking about the amplitude and the phase shift. Yeah. But you need to satisfy the Runquist sampling property to recover the frequency. Which property? The Runquist sampling property. Right. Yeah, so what happens is if you have one of the data models with a, with a different frequency, you need to have some other data with the with different frequencies so that you can borrow information. Otherwise, if there is no somehow commonalities, it's very hard to share information. Okay, so this is just one test we did where we have data sets from multiple domains. And uh, the goal is somehow to learn across the domains. Obviously, because the domains are different, there is an intrinsic domain shift across this data set. Um, and it turns out the model works surprisingly well um, across uh, this, this type of cartoons here in the situation. You still have a horse, you're trying to learn a horse as well, but it's just in different domains. Um, so we did some experiment, and I will talk a little bit about this experiment towards the end, where we have somehow different 3D printers distributed across the university. We actually bought the, these 3D printers, and turns out just by I I, um, I was setting them up and just by doing the screws a little bit less tight or more tight, you'll get very different outputs. Not very different, they're similar, but the outputs will be different in the nominal speed or the vibration. Turns out to be a good case study where we tested our model upon. Um, so I want to talk a little bit more about um, PCA to just give you an, a different dimension on this decentralized inference. So this talk that I will talk about is called P Personalized PCA Decoupling Unique and Shared Features. Okay, let me start what is the goal of this research. The goal is of this research is not a mapping between X and Y, it's just feature extraction. I assume that I have some data sets from multiple clients. This client one has a data set. This is actually a picture we took. Uh, uh, this is a cat. This is a cat that is moving from the door towards the camera. And the goal is, if we have these three data sets, can I learn a model that can extract the shared features across all the clients and the unique features for each client? So in the situation, somehow the shared features are the background and the unique features is just the cap that is moving. So this is the goal here. So the goal is feature extraction and how can I do that? Okay. So we choose to use PCA. And the idea of the modeling approach here is very simple. It's very intuitive. We assume that my data for a data set I, the data from data set I, comes from some set of global components. So UQ are the set of global components, where phi here is the PC scores of the global components. Some sets of local components that have index I, so each client has some set of local components and some nodes. So basically, I'm saying that my data is generated from a set of global components that are shared across all the data sets. And some set of local components that are unique to each data set. Okay. Of course, in general, we know that U and V should be orthonormal to learn PCA. But here, just the only trick that we use is that we say, okay, how can I decouple? How can I make sure the global components and the unique components do not overlay on the same space? What we add, we add a simple constraint. We say, okay, I want my global components and my local components to be orthogonal. I want them to model different features, okay, that span different spaces. So the model itself. What is the goal here? If you take, for example, those two data sets, data set one, data set two, and you learn two P, you learn uh, PCA rank two, you will find the first component is component uh, in the vertical direction, and the second component makes no sense because of the heterogeneity. PCA is well known; it will fail easily when you have heterogeneity. This component is just an average of the two data sets. The goal that we are trying to achieve is somehow we want this data, this lack arrow to be the global component and this those two arrows the blue and the pink to be the unique components of each client 
So each client is a function of the global component and the unique component. So this is the goal of, of this research. And actually, this is one of the case studies. So let us see what is the modeling formulation here. We know that in PCA, the reconstruction error can be solved also by uh, minimizing the variance. So if we write things in matrix notation, U are the global features, the global PCs, VI are the local PCs. So each client has some local PCs and YI are the data sets. So our goal is, is in the variance formulation is to maximize this trace, maximize the variance, sorry, maximize the trace uh, of the empirical covariance of the covariance matrix over the local components and the global components. And here are the assumptions. Uh, the global components are orthonormal, the local components are orthonormal, and the global and local components are orthogonal to each other, so that they model different things. I do want my global components and the local components to be different. Okay. So this is obviously a non-convex uh, constraint optimization. The first question that one can ask, is this model identifiable? Is it learnable? And the answer, of course, is it's not always identifiable. Why? Because if the data of on all clients is the same, you cannot separate the local and global components. So actually, just to remember in PCA, we have the eckhart Young field, very famous theorem, one of the few non-convex optimizations that we can solve to optimality, where if you're trying under just local global components, where if you're trying to do the R max of the trace here, you know that the solution spans the top eigen space of, of S, the covariance matrix S. This is a well-known design in, in PCA literature. However, as, as I mentioned, if my global components and my local components are exactly the same, this model definitely is not identified. So how can we identify or when is this model identified? It turns out it has a very simple and interesting condition. Turns out, let's assume pi i is the projection matrices, is the projections span by the true local PCs. So vi are the local PCs, the true local PCs. So pi i is just a projection matrix here using the true local PCs. Okay. Turns out that this model is identifiable if the local projections have some differences. So here we define the identifiability condition as the maximum hiding value of the average of the local projections is less than or equal one minus one minus theta. So if all the projection matrices are the same. This thing will be just one because the average will just be pi i, and pi i is a projection matrix, so its maximum eigenvalue will be just one. So theta, a larger theta, measures the differences in the local subspaces. Okay. So the higher theta is, the more different the data sets across the clients are. Turns out this simple assumption, this condition, is sufficient to get an identifiability condition. To, to identify our model here, this is a very informal theory. PU is a projection matrix, U, to transpose, or anything. The population covariance matrix satisfies the identifiability assumption. And if there is a good eigengap, uh, the eigengap is the difference between the first uh, and the second um, eigenvalues here, and the noise is sub Gaussian, then with good probability, you can get this convergence rate. We'll not go into details, but one interesting thing to note is theta is is in the denominator. And what does it say? It says that the more heterogeneous your data are, the better your recovery if you solve this problem to optimality is. And this is false in sharp contrast in the literature of federated learning in neural networks, because heterogeneity will hurt. In this situation, if you have more heterogeneity, it's better for me. It's easier to recover really the global and local components. This is intuitive, because the more heterogeneity, the better I can decouple those two components given my assumption that they are orthogonal. Um, so how to solve this problem? This is this identifiable condition is if we solve this problem to optimality. How do we solve this problem? The first intuition of how to solve this problem, we know that uh, first of all, we cannot, there is no closed form for this problem, not, not like PCA. Um, so we know that um, you, you, you transpose the orthonormal conditions form a stifle manifold. So the stifle manifold is the manifold of all uh, orthonormal matrices. And one thing that we can do, people usually do when they do manifold graded descent, is somehow they use stifle graded descent. So what stifle gradient descent is, you project the gradient, this is the gradient, you, you, you project the gradient on the tangent bundle, and then after projecting the gradient on the tangent bundle, 
you do descent in that bundle. Okay, you do this stifle gradient descent. So basically, you get the gradient, you project on the Kangen space, and you do the set. Okay? So this is one idea that, that one can do. And then after you do this, this, uh, this gradient descent, sometimes it's called the parallel descent. Okay, uh, then after you update the, the global and local components, then to aggregate the global components, the central server, or you can just take an average over all the global components to aggregate. Okay. I have not talked a lot, lot of distributed, but this model is, or this algorithm is intrinsically distributed because we'll talk about it in a bit. So this is a potential approach, but what is the challenge? There are two challenges. The first challenge is after you calculate the average, the U and V will not be orthogonal anymore. So this is not a feasible solution. So what do we do in this situation? So inspired by the Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization, somehow shred the VI matrix. So we project the local components VI on the space spanned by U and then subtract it from VI, okay? So by deflating, by projecting on the column space of U, this is very similar to the idea of Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization. But by projecting V under the column space of U and then deflating the matrix, we have that VI is orthogonal to U right now. That is an issue still. The issue is I'm not anymore on the stifle manifold after I do this Gram-Schmidt type orthogonalization. This is not orthogonal. However, interestingly, you're very close to the stifle manifold, turns out. So how can I somehow make the eyes orthogonal? And in this situation, turns out I will not go. This is some fancy math. Um, I how can I? Okay, this how a problem. <laughs> okay, so the, the screen below is not clear, but we find a generalization of retraction. So this the idea is that so we define something called generalized retraction. You know, a retraction in, in literature is a retraction is a mapping from the tangent bundle to the cipher bundle. Okay, here we define the idea of generalized retraction as a retraction from any D by R matrix under the cipher manifold. Okay. And we define a retraction as a retraction that has two conditions. First of all, it preserves the column space. We need that. Because if U and V are orthogonal, when I project uh, V into the tangent and the cipher manifold, I want this orthogonality to still hold. The second thing is I want it to be close in projection to the tangent space. Okay. So the idea here actually, I want my projection to be close to the tangent space. Actually, this. If you look at this function, we have this M2, this Frobenius norm is what is controlled by the error of the projection from the tangent space. If this epsilon rises on the tangent bundle, this becomes just the general reaction in literature. And interestingly, it turns out that the polar projection and the QR decomposition both are satisfied the, the generalized retraction. Both have exactly those two properties. If you do it directly to a retraction from from R D by R, not from the tangent bundle. Okay. This is a very interesting property. Why? Because after you have U and V orthogonal, they are close to the stifle manifold. So you can just do a polar decomposition or a QR decomposition and, it, and get a solution that lies on the stifle manifold. Okay. And the same thing can be done for the average. So in summary, the algorithm is very simple. Each client receives an initial feasible solution, okay? They connect the feasible solution VI to be orthogonal to you, okay? They do stifle gradient descent on both U and V. They send U and to a central server and U is just aggregated. So the key here, why this algorithm is naturally federated? Because there is only one, one matrix that you need to share. You just need to share your global components that just need to be aggregated or averaged and this is sufficient to learn this model. Okay. So despite all this math, the learning this model is very simple. You just do some kind of, you just do a correction, which is the gram schmidt orthogonalization. Okay. You do a generalized retraction, stifle gradient descent, take average. That's it for the model. Okay. Turns out also after some fancy math, this is a very informal theorem that if you initialize from a good solution, 
initialize close to the global solution, okay, you can get exactly the problem, okay, at an exponential. If you initialize one. Um, and again, the recovery is a function here of W of theta. And as your as your theta is larger, as you have more heterogeneity, the rates are much better. Okay. Again, this lies in sharp contrast. I want heterogeneity. If I want to decouple shared and unique features, I want more and more heterogeneity. Okay. Um, this is just what I so let me take a simple comparison that, that we did. We did some multiple tests here. Just looking at the time. So we did some multiple tests here. We took a very simple situation. Client one has a data set with a triangle, client two has a data set with a circle. We just have four points. That's it. Four points. And here we did something called robust PCA. Robust PCA is a famous approach where it decouples some global components and sparse matrix. Okay. There is no there is no order to consider it, but we are just assuming sparsity. Robust PCA really cannot be coupled, shared and unique features. However, our model here, those are just the local components, not the global components. The global components will just be the background. Just from four data points, we are able to find the shared, the local, the unique components across different clients. Okay. Um, another experiment here is much like this, going back to the image segmentation. This is what I started off with. Those are the global PCs, remember. What we find is the global residual components. And then to reconstruct the image, we just project on the space spanned by the global principal components. So it turns out that this is the common features, which is the background, and the local features, which are the cats here. To give you one interesting case study that we did, a little bit on the political side, we took the presidential debates from the past 60 years, okay, starting from 1960. And we said, okay, I want to find what are the words that are most commonly unique to each year, and what are the words that are common across all years. So those are the common words across all years, and those are the words unique to each year. Okay. For example, in 1988, when there was a drug problem, you see words like drug, young, string, strong, build, future. Okay. And the interesting thing, this is just my observation, you will see that across the years, there is a key change of focus from issues in early years to names in later years. In later years, we see the most names, Trump, Hillary, Pence, Joe Biden, Donald, more names. Previously, it was more issues. Just a simple, perhaps, conclusion. Okay, so this is just one potential of decoupling um, the shared and unique features. And really, I just should mention that this entire thing is based on just one assumption. I say, okay. We have global components, we have unique components, and I impose an orthogonality constraint. And really, the entire paper is just how to solve under this orthogonality constraint, which is not easy because you have a highly non convex optimization with orthonormality constraints, and you're adding an orthogonality constraint to that model as well. Um, so, those are the models that I will more want to mainly talk about. But before I end, I want to just give you a highlight on what we have been doing in this field, which I think is interesting. It's a new field, a lot, a lot is yet to be said just beyond neural networks. So the first thing is what we were working on is fairness, where we say, okay, we have multiple data sets. How can I somehow ensure a uniform performance across all clients? And this is for not only across all clients, but perhaps across groups of clients, how to solve this problem. It's also an interesting problem and here we just define some kind of a penalty on the loss function of each group of clients and it turns out that solving this problem is just based on a reweighting scheme you know empirical risk minimization is just an average or average over all the of each client's empirical risk it turns out that this problem is equivalent to just reweighting the client losses by the statistical ordering of the loss function of each client Turns out this has a very interesting solution. Another question that we ask is, how can we do a hypothesis test? How can I learn a linear model and do a hypothesis test or do variable selection? And our idea started by hierarchical modeling. So we said, okay, what if we assume that each client is generated from some parameter, but those parameters themselves lie in a latent space, T, and they're generated from one set of parameters. So hierarchical modeling is, is a statistical tool, it's a very old statistical tool, 
that allows borrowing strength across different data sets. Okay? It's where random effects started. And the idea is that I assume that different client parameters or the functions that control the heterogeneity across different parameters have a, 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 have a, are generated from the same random variable at the higher level of the hierarchy, which allows borrowing strength. And this, this small just assumption is what allows us to do to develop methods for, uh, for hypothesis assessing, for variable selection, and consistent estimators for linear models. Um, the last one that, that also we have been working on is mainly Gaussian processes. And Gaussian processes are interesting because they do automatic personalization. In a Gaussian process, if we all collaborate to learn a Gaussian process, we are not learning an individual. What, what we are not learning a global model, we're learning a global prior. We're learning a good starting point. Okay, and then prediction by the Gaussian process is what is you condition on that prior to get your predictions. So Gaussian processes are fundamentally and intrinsically personalization approaches to such a problem because you're just conditioning with your own data on the prior. So the question becomes how do you solve the Gaussian process in a distributed manner? Is it solvable? We know one key challenge in Gaussian process, much like unlike neural networks, neural networks. These, the empirical risk or the loss function, just a summation over the data points. But Gaussian processes feature correlation. How can I solve a distributed problem when there is correlation across the data? Is it solvable? So this is something we, we, we have been working on. It turns out it is solvable, but the, the statistical error of the convergence will never go to zero. It will always depend on your batch size. And this is a price to pay for our correlation. Um, so here I should mention that this is a new field and it's a field in its infancy. It's a field that we all know from a long time ago. It's very common, but why it's becoming important because the computational power has become very strong. Right now, five years ago, my, my, my phone could not solve, it could not find the gradient of a neural network here. Right now it can, it can find the gradient for a very deep neural network. This has opened up the opportunity to do this distributed, federated, decentralized, you call it types of analytics, where we are processing more of our data where it's created. However, only with engineering understanding of the underlying system, we can formulate the right analytics. This is why at the University of Michigan, we have created a website which acts as a directory for all data sets that have been generated in a distributed fashion which have some engineering applications or are based on engineering applications and really require some knowledge on the system to be able to solve them. And I do encourage you to contribute to the website itself. And here we envision that a lot of applications will be generated from such a system in distributed manufacturing and decentralized control of energy. A lot of efforts are right now being done in somehow uh, intersection control using smart vehicles by processing the data on the data itself. Um, I want to end by just mentioning um, one application that we are developing at the University of Michigan, which is based on distributed 3D printing. So at the University of Michigan, we have 3D printers distributed throughout the university. Not a lot, just six 3D printers. And our goal is to do what? Is to do collaborative experimental design. Okay, where well, the goal is, in general, if I want to find the optimal set of process parameters for myself, what do I need to do? I need to do multiple trial and error. I need to test at this set of process parameters, this set, this set, and there is a lot of literature on sequential design. But the question is, what happens if we all together can do this process? Can we do it faster? Can each one of us do a design, at an experiment at one specific location, we come back, we talk to each other, we see, okay, what is the next experiment we should do? Where is the next experiment we should do each of us? And as such, the goal is to uncover the optimal solution as fast as possible. And this is, comes in the notion, it can be framed as a notion as collaborative active learning, collaborative Bayesian optimization, collaborative sequential design. Those mean somehow pretty much the same thing, but are notations across different communities. So how uh, machine learning, statistics, industrial engineering, and so on and so forth. So the question here is, how can we do that? And interestingly, we have an algorithm based on consensus, much like blockchain, where after we do our own experiments, we agree together. We use consensus to decide what is the next, next set of points to, um, to, to solve the solution. 
Um, so we have a YouTube channel that we opened it on Federated Analytics at the University of Michigan, where you can find talks about all these all these uh, papers. And I definitely should thank my two students. Most of this work was done by them, not me. Uh, Chubo and, and Sok, both of them are on the job market. And by this, I end the talk. Thank you, everyone.